a continental strategy that will define the scale and cost competitiveness of a local manufacturing and production um, industry for vaccines on the continent with the aim of achieving or enhancing our global health security across the continent. We will support partnerships to create a conducive business environment that will encourage the emergence of thriving of a thriving manufacturing base. And we will play as uh, will act as interlocutor and a moderate, um, um, intermediary between member states, the private sector investors, the global community, and all supporters as needed to support the development of this ecosystem. And we will provide communication across the continent and globally and act as a central source of information on this ambitious initiative. Any chance of my slides coming up yet? Okay, um, we'll keep going because you have seen some of these uh, material already. So um, my apologies while the technology catches up with us. Um, the goal, as you've all heard, is that by 2040, we aim to move from producing just 1% of our vaccine needs on the continent to achieving at least 60% of our needs produced locally on, on the African continent. And to do that, the, we, we've developed a framework for action that will take us on the journey from where we are today to where we wish to be. The first step in this process has been to define the pinch points, the barriers, the bottlenecks, the problems, the challenges that we need to understand and therefore shape the solutions on the basis of that. So the first thing, it, it challenge was how do we ensure that we have a coordinated approach to, to scaling up vaccine manufacturing? As has been mentioned by other speakers, there is a big market for vaccine production on the continent, for vaccines on the continent. We estimate that um, Africa has the only re regional vaccine um, uh, ecosystem that is not yet reaching full penetration for existing vaccines. And also because of our um, risk of um, uh, epidemics and outbreaks, we also have the need to produce vaccines to meet our own specific priorities that may not be a priority for the global world. So, in, but in order to do that, we need to coordinate our ambitions because we cannot have all 55 member states manufacturing the same vaccines. So there's a, a priority to ensure that there's a coordinated approach. And which is why the African Union is the natural coordinating so, uh, mechanism for achieving that. We need to ensure that we can produce volume guarantees to support large scale demand and investment. Financiers need to be sure that they will achieve the, 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 the yield that they expect for their investment. So we need to make sure that we balance the vol volumes that are produced with what the market can, can finance and can, and can absorb. We need to ensure that there is sustained financing for the long term. And then we need to increase the momentum of technological transfers and to simplify the intellectual property landscape so they can support a new and emerging system. We need to ensure that we have the resources and capabilities in the red national regulators, and especially through the coordinating function of the Africa Medicines Agency to ensure that there's a harmonized approach to licensing and recognition of vaccines that this uh, industry will produce. Foundationally, we need to ensure we have the research and development but, uh, capacity to inform the development of new vaccines and to um, support the licensing and approval of any vaccines that will be produced um, on the continent. We also need to be supporting the development of the workforce that this uh, system will need. And this is um, nurturing the, both from a, a, a pharmaceutical, technological, industrial talent um, that will be necessary to support this um, industry. And then we also need to, identify, to build the basic infrastructure, not just the buildings within which the manufacturing will occur, but the supporting logistics that are required, transport, utilities, et cetera, to start support um, the industry. So these are the key areas of need that have been identified by the partnership and on which it has based its solutions. I'll ask again, any chance of the slides coming up? Can we get some indication? Are, are we getting my slides up? Well, we'll keep going for one at a time. We don't want to keep everybody waiting for too long. Um, so 
The framework for, for action has been developed through a coordinated effort across these distinct, distinct areas, and we developed work streams that have been led by experts in the subject matter across the continent. And I would like to take the opportunity here uh, to repeat um, uh, Dr. John's thanks to all the organizations whose um, experts and leaders have taken on the responsibility of leading the various task force that have made up the Partnership for Africa Vaccine uh, Manufacturing, so for the various work streams that have made up the PAVM task force. The task force members have been working for more than 30 hours attending workshops and summits, over 100 hours of working sessions, plus 60 hours of the Secretariat problem solving um, since the end of July to bring us to where we are today. And when my slides finally come up, uh, you will see the, the breadth of um, support and organizations that have supported the work so far. The partnership for the PAVM task force led by the Africa CDC Secretariat, um, which has taken the coordinating and agenda setting responsibility, has had six key work streams, market design and de demand intelligence and um, regulatory strengthening, access to finance, technology and intellectual property, research development and talent development, infrastructure development. Those six work streams have produced the solutions that I'll be presenting shortly. Slides. I do not think we seem to have any progress. Um, I really apologize. It is important that you see some of the um, uh, images that will summarize the uh, what I'm presenting, but we'll keep going and um, I'm sure access to the slides will be made available in due course. So what, have we, the, what has the task force um, produced to address those um, bottlenecks and those barriers that I, I summarized? We've, we've developed what we call eight bold programs programs defined by the work streams to support various aspects of the um, manufacturing ecosystem and the continental strategy. So first and foremost is the strategy itself. What do we intend to produce? What should, make, what should be the components of that 60% um, uh, of our local needs by 2040? And then, as has already been mentioned, and you would have seen this slide earlier when Dr. John uh, presented, how do we strengthen our regulatory ecosystem? Ensuring that we embed the, the solution proposes that we embed vaccine regulatory excellence in national regulatory authorities and the regional centers for regulatory excellence, working with the AMA as it comes on, on stream and the AMRH as, as that has been uh, doing some of this harmonization work already. Developing an R and D and uh, looking at R and D and talent development, the proposal is to have a vac to develop vaccine R and C centers and R&D coordinating units. The, can you go back, please? We've not got there yet, now that we've got the slides. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Yeah, thank you. Um, so infrastructure development, looking at advocacy for enabling trade policies that will promote free transfer and, uh, or smooth transfer of manufactured vaccines across the continent. Technology transfer and IP ensuring that we develop an enabling unit that will smooth the process of supporting manufacturers to acquire technology and developers to retain to develop and retain the IP for the products that they produce that they, they offer vaccine manufacturing deal preparation and financing facilities the uh, president of the Africa Zip bank and the representative of Africa Development Bank already talked about the ambitions around improving access to finance by providing support to support the development of deals as they're defined. And most uh, also important is around market design and demand intelligence and extending the Africa, developing the African vaccines procurement pooling mechanism, building on what has been developed for COVID um, to extend that to a broader vaccine market. Next slide. To do this, we and estimate, and I will stress that this is an early estimate that will do uh, benefit from further refinement. We estimate that it will cost us about 30 billion to finance the implementation of these bold uh, plans that we have proposed over the next 20 years. Now, 30 billion might sound like a lot, but as uh, Professor Sanai uh, mentioned, we already spend about 16 billion a year 
on imported um, uh, pharmaceutical products. So over 20 years, we think that this is a reasonable um, cost. Most of that investment will be on strengthening our research and development capacity to ensure that we can actually support the vaccines that will be manufactured and to start to be, uh, develop new vaccines that will be required um, for our, our ecosystem. So we'll, this uh, cost will include R&D supporting running an R&D coordinating platform, investment in vaccine development and improvement in vaccine manufacturing capacity and technologies. And the next big area of investment is actually in technological transfer and IP. And this will help to set up the tech transfer and IP enabling units and to run out royalty fees, the costs of actually obtaining technology transfer. After that, the next, uh, another big area of investment is in the actual capital in, uh, investment for infrastructure, supporting the development of the manufacturing plants themselves and the cold chain that will be, and logistics that will be required to support the distribution of vaccines developed. But as we've said, the, in addition to those, those, we do need to ensure that that the regulatory ecosystem is, is strengthened and there is an urgency to build in that capacity now to support the initiatives that are already developing on the ground to improve vaccine manufacturing, not just for COVID, but moving beyond that. So it's important to stress that the framework for action is a living document that will be reviewed regularly and as new technologies and opportunities emerge, as we, we're, we're currently just in the process of Gavi has just committed to start to distribute the recently approved malaria vaccine. So we expect that we will have to adjust and adapt what we are producing to align with the changes in technology and in the burden of disease and demand. Next uh, slide, please. So we, as this, as the, the industry um, uh, evolves and adapts, we expect the framework to also continue to adapt. It's important to stress that the framework for action is not a recipe book. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a guideline. It's, an, it's about creating an enabling environment. It does not seek to limit innovation or entrepreneurship. What we aim, we aim to achieve is flexible guidance to support those with an ambition to build into a co coordinated African manufacturing uh, ecosystem for vaccines. Next slide. Now for the, the next round table discussion after my presentation, we'll be looking at some of the local manufacturing opportunities and uh, projects that are already evolving on the continent. But as I said at the beginning of my presentation, one of the key things that we actually need to do in order to define this goal of 60% of our vaccine manufacturing by 2040 is to understand what it is within that 60%. Our first step is what should make up that 60%. To do so, we have attempted to address the following questions. What vaccine should we prioritize for production locally? How many doses of such vaccines will be required to meet the goal and ensure economic viability for the manufacturers? What technologies should we encourage? And how do we ensure that we future-proof the technological investments? And where along the value chain should we operate to ensure sustainability of this industry? And the answers to all these questions will help us address the fundamental ambition, which is to develop a vaccine manufacturing industry that will improve Africa's health security, promote economic growth, and contribute to delivering a new public health order for Africa. So the following slides summarize our thinking, which we'll explore in more detail through the various um, roundtable discussions that will follow the rest of today and tomorrow. Next slide. So, the ambition to create to produce 60% of vaccines uh, by 2040, we estimated that to achieve that, we would need to be producing between 1.5 to 1.7 billion vaccine doses locally on the continent. And the graphic that you see before you there outlines our thinking about how that those vaccines are created. So we have um, based, worked out the, this demand based on current um, vaccine uh, demand anticipated ex increases in vaccine demand for existing vaccines, particularly because we are aware that there are already licensed products that we are currently not optimally disseminating to our citizens on the continent. And then looking at the growth of the, um, the eligible population for vaccination um, across the continent. And we've used that to estimate 
the amount of vaccine doses we'll need to, achieve, to produce to reach that 60% need. So next slide. So the, conti the, the continental strategy has based, as Duntman has come up with, this is a summary of what the key headlines, the potential diseases to be prioritized, the technological focus, and where on the value chain we operate. So we've looked at what we've, we've grouped the vaccines in terms of diseases that they address into legacy, expanding, and outbreak. The legacy vaccines are those that are predominantly part of our routine childhood immunization programs and beyond, and for which we currently, the, where the, the vast majority of our investment in vaccine uh, programs exists currently. Expanding are the new vaccines that are gradually becoming coming on stream, such as the HPV vaccine, pneumococcal vaccines. Uh, we've included COVID-19 vaccines in that group, rotavirus, recently licensed the malaria vaccine, and then vaccines that don't quite yet exist, HIV, but which the, the new technology suggests that the, uh, a, a possible solution might be more imminent than we previously considered. And then we've looked at outbreak vaccines. These are vaccines that we may only need in response to outbreaks rather than as part of routine immunization programs. Some of these exist, such as the recently licensed Ebola vaccine, um, long-standing influenza vaccines, and some of which are um, under development are a part of a research agenda, for example, Lassa fever. And we've included in there disease X. And we refer to disease X because we know that there will be outbreaks, there will be new emerging infections, whether they're localized or global, that will challenge the system and for which the ability to produce a vaccine will be necessary. In terms of looking at the technological focus, there's a breadth of, of technological platforms that are used for vaccine manufacturing currently. More traditionally, we have our live attenuated vaccines and our inactivated vaccines on which the bulk of our routine immunization programs are based. But as we move into new technology, in particular, the RNA and DNA based technology, those are new. Currently, the only mRNA based uh, vaccines are COVID vaccines, but the technology offers promise for not only for improving the, the op options for existing um, uh, vaccines, but to actually produce vaccines for some of the diseases that have evaded uh, traditional systems so far. And in terms of the value chain to focus on, um, fill and finish is where you go for quick turnaround if you want to start producing uh, uh, doses very quickly. Um, and it is also uh, te technologically agno agnostic so that you can actually have a single um, facility doing fill and finish for a number of um, vaccines. But if we're to look at a sustainable and long-term vaccine um, ecosystem, we need to move towards the right um, of uh, that, um, uh, that graphic and start to consider the production of drug su substance, uh, looking at raw materials that will support the vaccine manufacturing industry. And most importantly, we need to develop and ex expand our R&D activities so that we can develop vaccines for Africa that meet our own priorities. In our disease list and outbreak list, we mentioned Lassa fever, which is a major uh, challenge for us on the continent for which there is currently no vaccine. There's a priority for us in, in developing the research and development to support the emergence of those vaccines and that meet our unique uh, needs on the continent. There's also existing vaccines where there may be nuances to in terms of serotype, for example, with HPV, where the dominant serotypes on our continent are slightly different from those that are co covered in the existing vaccines. So there is a need for R&D to support um, the, the um, strategy. So in looking across that, we've considered um, how did we come to these conclusions of these diseases? Next slide, please. So we've looked at need, burden of disease, manufacturing feasibility and attractiveness for manufacturers. And as I've described, we talked about the legacy diseases, which are high volume, relatively low cost, um, but there are other new diseases, which are moderately higher prices, which we have not yet, have not yet had the pen penetration that we wish to see on the continent. We've looked at the various technological trans, uh, uh, platforms and explored the pros and cons of the existing traditional, more traditional technologies and the opportunities presented by the novel technologies. And then across the value chain, the value of a quick um, um, return around in fill and finish, but more sustained and more uh, reliability and sustainability by moving across to drug substance as well as R&D. So 
our assessment as a, a PAVM uh, task force is that to achieve the continental strategy by 2040, we need to take a fully integrated approach that requires an end-to-end -end ecosystem working from R&D, drug substance, to fill and finish, looking at the broad spectrum of uh, technologies and aiming for um, uh, those 22 diseases plus disease X. Next slide. So from volume maximization, uh, fill and finish would achieve that. Technological coverage, we need to look at the breadth, not just focusing on, 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 on uh, the traditional, more traditional technologies. And the, so the integrated, integrated, the fully integrated ecosystem, which we're proposing, will then require the support of the solutions that we've outlined in those eight bold programs that I started uh, this presentation with. Next slide. So um, we, do not, we do not suggest that this is the only approach that could be taken to address these, these questions, but we are moderately confident that we're on the right track. And this is because of the level of input we've had from experts across the continent and the globe to inform our thinking and to help us to define our solutions. That said, discussions today and the ongoing independent scientific review will also help us to validate and improve the proposals in this framework for action. As previously, as previously stated, the PAVM framework for action will be a living document. It will be informed by new intelligence and new perspectives in this dynamic space. And so we urge all of you to please engage with the conversations, the roundtables, and the discussions that we're going to have over the next two days to help us to improve and to refine these proposed solutions that we're presenting to you in the framework for action. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, my co-lead for the PAVM Secretariat, Dr. Nikkei Sindembi, who is the um, is advice, senior scientific advisor to the Director of Africa CDC. I'd like to thank all the organizations who have lent, lent us their experts and the leaders who have led and steered the work streams that have produced these um, solutions. And to thank our colleagues from, the, uh, from McKinsey who have worked behind the scenes to support the Secretariat and the task force to present you with these proposals today. And with that, I would like to um, thank you all for, for listening and apologize for the technological problem that delayed the presentation of the slides. And without much ado, I'd like to introduce you to your moderator for the first round of discussions that will follow, follow right after this. Ms. Glaudina Lutz is the Director for Health Innovation at the Department of Science and Technology and responsible for the implementation of the health components of the bioeconomic strategy for South Africa. And she will be your moderator for the next session and will be joining us virtually. So I'd like to thank you for listening and hand you over to Glaudina. Thank you. Uh, good day to all the participants and thank you, Dr. Dr. Berry, it's always so good to see your enthusiasm for what we are trying to do here in Africa. This is such a momentous occasion and the number of distinguished guests and speakers attest to it. And I would really like to acknowledge the support of our political leaders and the science leaders in Africa in setting the vision and the pathway for sustainable vaccine manufacturing in Africa. This is a dream that we can make real. And thank you for the opportunity to, to interact with you. So the previous speakers has set the scene why local manufacturing of health products are important. So in this panel, we're going to look joined by a panel of experts from six African countries to discuss how local vaccine manufacturing priorities as set out by Dr. Iberi and how it will take the, to actualize this. How do we actually going to do it? And, and make it a reality on, um, in going forward. The panelists are Dr. Amida Saul, Director for Institute Pasteur de Dakar, Senegal. I would appreciate if the panelists can just acknowledge that they are there. Just switch on your videos, please, if it's possible. Uh, the second one is Dr. Stavros Nicolau, the group senior executive of Aspen Pharmacare Group from South Africa. Then Dr. Heba Wali, president and chairman of the board of directors for Axira, Egypt. Uh, Dr. 
Abu Dhirmani Marufi Institute Basir du Maroc, Morocco. Dr. Yao Adu Gayamfi, Senior uh, Chief Executive Officer of DEK Vaccines Limited, Ghana. Dr. Morena Makuana, CEO of BioVac, Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Sabin Nasi Zimani, Director General Rwanda Biomedical Center. And lastly, Dr. Shahir Bardisi, the CEO, CEO of Mina Farm, Egypt. Thank you for joining us. I think we might be missing one or two. Dr. Giyamfi, I appreciate your willingness to talk. I can see you are on, on, on route somewhere and thank you for that. So the continental strategy shortlist a priority list of diseases with the aspiration to produce vaccines for these diseases. So I'm going to ask each panelist to give us a short overview of what synergies exist between your plans and priorities for vaccine manufacturing and this ambitious continental vaccine strategy. We will start off, Stavros Nikolai, can I ask you to kick off the discussion? Uh, program moderator, uh, Ms. Claudina Lutz, um, for and to the extent that uh, any of the excellencies, uh, distinguished officials might be on the platform still. Uh, greetings to you all. And it is indeed a great pleasure uh, to share some thoughts with you today again. Uh, let, let me at the outset uh, cover uh, three areas that I'd like to uh, emphasize and place some significant focus on. The, the first is, of course, to re-highlight the significant import bias and vaccine inequality and uneven distribution that continues to disfigure the continent. Uh, you've heard the statistics previously, we import 99% or more of the uh, continent's vaccine requirements. We also know that vaccines are the most effective way of preventing disease. And for a continent that has the most disproportionate disease burden of, of any continent in the world, it continues to be puzzling and confounding that we continue to import so many vaccines. So that is the first area I want to preface. The second area I want to cover is, in responding to your question directly, uh, Claudina, is that we very often don't have confidence on our very own on our very own continent that we can have local capacities to solve local problems. So there's, if you want to call it a, a, a lack of confidence, uh, you might call it a, an internal Afro pessimism that we cannot solve our own problems through local capacities. And then the very final issue I'd like to cover, again, prefacing my response, is the issue of sustainable capacity on the continent. So there's a lot of talk and a lot, a lot of initiatives um, currently underway uh, to, ensure that the confident, uh, to ensure that the continent puts up its own capacities, its own capabilities. But all of these things, as I've said on many previous platforms, will land up being white elephants unless we can ensure sustainable, consistent, and regular offtakes to those manufacturers on the continent. So, Claudina, those are the three things I wanted to really try and emphasize on this call. Let me uh, now, in response, uh, just unpack some of these very quickly. And I'm going to unpack them by saying, that last week, Aspen and Johnson & Johnson announced a non-binding term sheet whereby uh, Johnson & Johnson have licensed the rights to their intellectual property for the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine to Aspen Pharmacare. This is a significant 
game changer for the continent. Of course, many of you would have followed the story and will know that uh, Aspen has already been a contract manufacturer for Johnson & Johnson. We've in fact produced over 120 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So anybody that doubts that the continent can't do it, uh, you know, here's the evidence, right? We've produced 120 million doses already under contract manufacturing. But what this does is it takes it uh, significantly forward in terms of local capacity and solving local problems. This now means that Africa has its first COVID vaccine. Uh, it means that uh, we would now determine both the availability um, allocation and, uh, and distribution of the vaccine. Of course, the, the licensing rights that we received is only for the African continent. And that is frankly where Aspen's interest lies. We've worked with many partners on this platform to achieve this wonderful announcement, this game-changing announcement uh, last uh, Tuesday afternoon. And for that, I'm very grateful to every single partner on this call, Claudina, including yourself in South African government for the role that you have played in this. And it is a real game changer. But the point I really want to make, Lodina, is if people doubt that we can do things, we don't have the skills, we don't have the technologies and all these other things that you hear, well, 120 million doses are telling me a very different story. So I think we can all give ourselves as Africans, um, we're not gonna be complacent or arrogant about this, but we can all give ourselves a pat on the back because the, this is the first African company on the continent that is producing a COVID vaccine and it is gone to Africa. 2% yeah. of this yeah. has gone into yeah. thank you for okay. Thank you for uh, that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we we actually the, got limited time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I would like to give this similar opportunity to the other panel members. We know you love your story, but... There are other things. May I go now to Dr. Heba Wali from Egypt, to the other side of Africa, and actually give us your, how do you see what you are doing synergize with the ambitions of this strategy? Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, Ms. Yes, we can hear you. So, thank you, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with all the African, to African countries the experience with Egypt for uh, direction of uh, public vaccine from bulk ready to sell. As well, we have our experience from uh, have our own vaccine starting from uh, R and D. So, uh, it was a really great challenge for us as. Uh, all know that we have a very limited uh, number of doses of invested vaccine to the country. So we start thinking to have a key plan uh, for the production of the public vaccine. And we also saw the technology transfer agreement with Sinovac. Uh, and now uh, we find the agreement last April, and now we produce more than 25 million doses, which is securing the, the demand in the Egyptian market from uh, public vaccine. As well, we had uh, uh, our own vaccine which is developed uh, from the one of the largest vaccine, uh, so the largest research institute in Egypt. And um, now we finished the preclinical phase and we're going to now for phase uh, one in the clinical trial. So, this is the experience hearing from, from Egypt uh, about uh, the importance of uh, the country to start thinking about. Uh, uh, from my point of view, three uh, panels for the vaccine uh, development. So the first one was the R&D. So we should work very close with our scientists, physicians, technicians, product and manufacturing engineering. Uh, we all together, we are working very close in order to have the vaccine in place. But as you know, for uh, to have a facility for the production of vaccine, and uh, the time uh, is remaining the major barrier for vaccine development in epidemic diseases. It's usually, uh, I'm talking in a normal case, it takes more than 10 years or more to achieve licensed vaccine. Uh, so we should be prepared to have a facility comply with the DMD requirement 
is a very strong potential to develop uh, the production uh, process. The stock capacity also is one of the major uh, concerns in the reduction of the material, as well as uh, the, the cost is sent to the validation of the manufacturing process. So it's uh, all uh, it's time consuming, and in case of crisis, uh, and uh, we can talk from the COVID-19 uh, lesson learned that uh, we should have in place uh, the facility ready. And uh, it was a uh, great chance for us so that we had already the facility in place. We met uh, some adaptation with the uh, technology transfer uh, uh, provider uh, to be complied with their own process. But it is not only that what we are working with, but also nowadays we work with the team of that, uh, in order to, ha to have a complete technology transfer from drug uh, services. So uh, we should prepare very well for the next uh, uh, era, uh, not only for COVID, but also expecting if we have another type of viruses, maybe it is going to be exist. So uh, this is uh, coming from our experience in Egypt uh, concerning the protection of vaccine. Uh, and now uh, we can prepare a facility uh, we, now we have a new technology uh, to have a facility flexible for more than one side of the vaccine. Uh, for example, adaptive single use technology to increase the uh, operational flexibility and efficiency while the mechanical infrastructure. So this is one of the new technologies using nowadays. Uh, and also uh, from the perspective of industry, where we should have, uh, we should increase the capacity not only from pandemic but also for the preparation, not only for one side of the technology, but we should increase for more than five. So now, as, uh, as I mentioned, that we want to see that which we are using inactivated the vaccine. And now also we have the working to have the singular IV uh, vaccine. So uh, diversity in the technology is one of the mandatory needs for to have more than one side, and uh, we are not looking only for COVID uh, vaccine, but also for other side of vaccine. And uh, I'm telling also the experience of Vaxera. Uh, Vaxera has more than 100 year experience in the production of the vaccine. So in the 13th of the last century, we did cholera vaccine, we did polio vaccine. So we have a lot of experience. So this is my uh, advice and little learning from different crises that we should take care of, not only uh, when we have three pillars, we should tackle and take care of the R&D, the technology transfer, as well the preparation for the facility itself. Thank you. Talking to myself, thank you for, for your contribution. It is, it is, it's so good to see that Africa as a whole, and it's not sort of only sub-Saharan or Africa, but it's actually Africa as a whole is seeing how we can try to, to address this thing. Now let's move to West Africa. Uh, Professor Marufi, how we all are aiming to start producing and we're all looking at um, how we can assist Africa, but how do we stop oversupply? If each country now going to start looking, say, yes, we want to make, how do we actually, what is your thoughts on how do we make this happen, but not kill one another in the process? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, merci beaucoup, uh, Madame Claudina. Uh, je voudrais tout d'abord uh, remercier vivement les organisateurs uh, de m'avoir convié à cette réunion très importante et féliciter vraiment uh, le CDC Africa et tous ses partenaires pour tous les progrès qui sont réalisés dans cette initiative de partnership pour le vaccine manufacturé. So, uh, en ce qui concerne uh, le Maroc, uh, le Royaume du Maroc, il, il s'inscrit effectivement dans cette dynamique. Nous avons fait vraiment des pas très importants uh, dans cette voie de développement de la fabrication locale au Maroc. Tout d'abord, ce leadership, euh, euh, vraiment, et le suivi euh, et l'engagement de Sa Majesté le Roi euh, Mohamed VI, c'est très important, cet engagement de haut niveau de l'État marocain pour euh, faire amener vraiment euh, ce projet de fabrication. 
Donc, il a été lancé tout un programme ambitieux euh, de fabrication de vaccins, et pas uniquement les vaccins, mais aussi les biotechnologies euh, de manière générale dont on aura besoin pour faire face aux différents défis sanitaires. Alors, la particularité du modèle marocain, c'est que premièrement, nous utilisons ça selon une approche de euh, partenariat public-privé, public-private partnership. Alors, dans ce sens-là, l'État, il garde la souveraineté sur vraiment la production du vaccin et des biotechnologies, mais qu'il peut euh, sous-traiter euh, cette activité avec le secteur privé qui est déjà en avance et qui est développé euh, au niveau du Royaume du Maroc. Alors, deuxième chose en termes de stratégie de déploiement de ce plan, nous avons commencé par d'abord les, euh, les opérations de fill and finish, donc pour euh, d'abord les premiers produits qui se sont ciblés, c'est le, le vaccin de la COVID-19, donc on a signé une, un contrat euh, euh, de transfert industriel et analytique avec Sinopharm, les transferts ont été déjà euh, faits et on s'apprête à lancer vraiment la production des lots industriels dans les prochains jours et, et parallèlement, à moyen terme, donc, il y a tout un portefeuille de, de vaccins aussi qui vont être euh, fabriqués, euh, qui ciblent un certain nombre de maladies. Et c'est là vraiment aussi important que euh, dans notre vision euh, au, au Royaume du Maroc, et c'est la vision aussi de notre roi, que ce plan et ce programme de fabrication il doit répondre non seulement aux besoins du Royaume du Maroc, mais aussi du continent africain. Et donc, l'intérêt de s'aligner effectivement sur la stratégie continentale africaine, c'est quelque chose qui est euh, très présent dans notre vision. Et, et, et je me rappelle le concept qui est utilisé par notre pouvoir d'atteindre vraiment l'objectif de la souveraineté sanitaire, en particulier vaccinale, au niveau national et au niveau euh, euh, africain. Alors, en ce qui concerne la, 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 les aspects de gestion des risques de euh, surapprovisionnement. Moi, je pense que c'est un, 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 un aspect très important qui doit être présent dans notre stratégie et essentiellement euh, important de mettre en place des mécanismes de régulation de la production euh, des vaccins au niveau continental. C'est le rôle un peu de ces agences africaines de médicaments, euh, régula régulariser et réguler les autorisations les accords d'autorisation pour la mise sur le marché, c'est extrêmement important, et aussi euh, réguler au niveau euh, de la production. Moi, je pense que c'est extrêmement important, cette stratégie qui a été euh, lancée par le CDS Africa et la vision de créer des hubs régionaux de producteurs. Nous, les producteurs au niveau africain, on doit s'organiser en réseaux euh, euh, régionaux, et ces réseaux, euh, ils doivent un peu travailler en, en collaboration, en partenariat pour euh, d'abord répartir le marché et, et, et la population au niveau africain et aussi répartir les produits. Moi, je pense que ce serait important qu'il y ait une régulation continentale qui essaye un peu de, de réguler la production à travers ces hubs régionaux avec une répartition, une régulation aussi. Chaque hub, par exemple, aurait en charge un certain nombre de vaccins, parmi les 22 vaccins qui sont maintenant priorisés dans la stratégie, qu'il y a chaque hub il prend une partie pour comme ça qu'il n'y ait pas vraiment un dédoublement d'efforts et qu'il y ait une répartition des efforts au niveau vraiment de notre continent. Ça me semble extrêmement important qu'il y ait cette régulation de la production et une régulation aussi au niveau des autorisations de mise sur le marché pour prévenir tout risque de surapprovisionnement et de surproduction sur le continent africain. Donc voilà un petit peu ma, ma vision et ma proposition des, des mécanismes, à mon avis, qui seront importants à prendre en compte dans la gestion de ce risque-là. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for your contribution. Much appreciated. Um, Dr. Gamfe, your opinion on We, how are we doing it and how do we sort out this potential risk of oversupply? Well, thank you, Madam Moderator. Basically, what you see here is a matter of just like 
gone are the days when anybody who wrote, read the book Scramble for Africa. When our colonial masters came to try to take us, they will scramble for us. What we are faced right now, oh, <laughs> what we are faced right now is basically a matter that applies to every black person or every African. It's not a matter of individual countries. It's not about our Ghana, it's not about Nigeria or South Africa. What we are talking about, what can we do in order to have vaccines for every citizen of Africa? So it's a continental fight that we are doing. And I think the time has come that our political leaders need to understand that it's a collaboration. It's not a time for individualizing, trying to spring every country individually up. When you come to Ghana, like what we have done is basically our company with the private sector working with the government of Ghana under his excellence tonight, Adam Kokufuado, is DEK. We are three pharmaceutical, local indigenous pharmaceutical companies, Dan Adams, NS Kida Pharma, have come together as one consortium to work with every pharmaceutical company in this country for us to find an answer to vaccines in Ghana. And I think BAVM, for them to achieve what they intend to do for us, we need to work together as a 54 countries, achieving one goal in order to get vaccination for 1.3 billion people of Africa. So our strategy in terms of it, they need to look at the overwhelmed continental framework, just like our sister just presented. The same has been done in Ghana. Our government, through the committee that is set up, have put up a, a countrywide I mean, framework. Like we told His Excellency and the committee, this is not about Ghana. This is about ECOWAS. This is about Africa. What we want to do is that in order to prevent this oversupply or everybody trying to be on their own, it will not work. We need to strategize and say that if whether it's a regional approach or whatever way it's approach, we need to address that, that we make sure that there will be not oversupply because people are going to make investments in what they are going to do. What is the point of every country trying to put 10, 20 million dollars into it? Meanwhile, what we are talking about right now, we need 40 billion dollars by 2040 to get this done. So it's going to take an aggregation to get this done. So I appeal to our political leaders, all our knowledgeable brain, the brains are here, that we have enough Africans with the brains that can make sure we get this done. And all that we need to try to avoid is that me too. Uganda wants to do their own, South Africa wants to do their own. We don't need to stand up on individually, but we need to stand up as a continent and fight this pandemic that is facing us. That idea must come through as that all of us are working together, but not in individual countries. As we sit down in Ghana, our food and drug regulatory FDA is at the level three of the breacher. If this FDA can serve the whole ECOWAS, so be it. Let us do the FDA of Ghana to serve the whole ECOWAS. That is what I'm saying. There has to be regional work rather than individualism. We have been individualists for so long and nothing has been accomplished. The time has come for us to come together and work for the good of the continent of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Dr. Makuana, um, how should manufacturers, what, what should they be doing to ready themselves for the newer technologies like, such as mRNA and to, so also ensure that you stay competitive and how do you do this mix of technologies? Thank you, Dodina. And also I'd like to thank uh, the Africa CDC for inviting uh, me to, to be on this panel. Um, I just Googled very quickly, when was the first mRNA uh, vaccine? Um, proven to work uh, in phase three clinical trials. And it was on the 10th of December uh, last year that Pfizer announced the efficacy results. Uh, so we actually probably, you know, four days to go and, um, before we get to the first year anniversary of the world, knowing that mRNA vaccines firstly do exist and secondly, they do work. Now, it being 12 months since the technology has been proven to work, I think it's amazing that, and we should be very proud and just to echo the other speakers that firstly, that uh, we can talk about African vaccine manufacturing of the newest technology being mRNA. 
uh, already being announced, um, certainly through our company, Biorec. But secondly, that the WHO also, I mean, identified uh, essentially us as a continent in terms of setting up the WHO mRNA hub. And when all of these announcements were done, this was six months after mRNA technology was proven to work globally. So while six months in a pandemic sounds very, very long, but I think we should be very proud that Africa has at a minimum two initiatives, one being through the mRNA hub and the other one through BioVac and Pfizer collaborating on uh, full finish uh, on the mRNA vaccine. So I think I'd like to echo the other speakers that we do have the capability and also that we can work collaboratively because as part of that, there's a big consortium that is also out there. So with that then, Katina, I think it's important that to understand that all of these initiatives and these announcements it cannot come on the back of nothing that exists. I think it's important that we understand the long journey that it takes to build vaccine manufacturing capability. And that for us as Africans to get more and more of such similar um, uh, partnerships and investment, and many of which, uh, you know, Dr. Kengason, um, uh, you know, outlined in uh, in his slides, is that we need to make sure that we have a fertile environment in which to be able to absorb these opportunities. So I think the first message is that it's done and we can be proven. mRNA has come. Uh, to the continent, not only in terms of finished goods, but we will be manufacturing them locally. And also there is R&D that is happening on mRNA through the hub. So I think that's first and foremost important uh, to acknowledge. Now, in doing that, I think we have a big task to make sure that whilst we are having many balls that are, are being juggled, that we do make sure that we do not drop any balls. And that essentially means that we need to keep focus. And this is really even beyond mRNA technology on any of the entities or any of the initiatives that are being there, whether it's universities, yeah. whether it's R&D, whether it's manufacturing, is that whilst you have your trade, I think is to go deeper into your trade. Mm -hmm. So if we're in mRNA vaccine, which us as BioVac have determined, that's a technology that we are going to go deep in, not only in fill finish, but we are also part of the hub going to be in R&D, want to go through clinical trials. So we want to really be a specialist in the technology so that we can utilize it for us. And therefore, viral vector players, you know, must go deep into viral vector vaccine, you know, or any other product. So I think it's, we should, you know, whilst everything we talk about COVID vaccines, but we really need to be specialists uh, in the various technologies that we have. And that is the only way that we can also be sustainable, but also be able to apply it elsewhere. It also brings focus to, to investors to say, okay, this company is more of this specialist versus the other one. It brings confidence to investors, uh, but also will bring in other opportunities, uh, I do believe. Skills, that is very key. The mRNA technology is something that, from a skills basis, whether you look at from R and uh, manufacture or from R and D, is a new skill set that Africa is going to learn through the initiatives that I've already outlined. So I think it's very, very important that we 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 do not ignore, you know, the fact that we really need to go deep into this. And whilst we need to have multiple technologies, I think companies must not stretch themselves too far wide and pick one or two technologies for which you know, you will go deep in and be known and to be specialized and thrive. Uh, I'll just pause there, uh, Dodima. Uh, thank you, Dr. Makuana. Um, much appreciate your insight. Dr. Sabin Nsimana, you, how do you feel you, you are embarking on I don't want to say starting from scratch, but I think it's very, very brave. But how do you feel you're going to stay relevant and be up to the latest technology and form these partnerships to, to serve Africa? We, we can't hear you. We can test sound. Is it better now? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, very pleased to join my colleagues and thank you, uh, Africa CDC, for uh, convening all of us here. 
Um, I think this morning we've received very uh, important statistics on how we must work together uh, because this virus seems to be uh, well in synergy with its variants than we are doing as um, scientists, as researchers, to be able to be ahead of, of it. Uh, otherwise, we'll always be running behind uh, uh, testing new variants and uh, developing new test kits and medications. And, and vaccines. So that is uh, an important call for action. And as Rwanda, as uh, uh, scientists and uh, implementers in this uh, field, we are very much uh, concerned and some actions taken already um, uh, making progress. So I want to highlight a few things on what we're doing here, uh, not only in uh, contribution to research uh, globally, but also uh, stopping these variants, because as far as the various uh, the virus evolves and uh, mutates. No one is safe uh, because the borders are not uh, respected by any of these uh, pathogens, and that is very important. So the teamwork required uh, among all of us is uh, more than urgent than before. Uh, last week, uh, I was uh, able to meet my colleague, Professor Marufi, who is online, uh, when he was showing me what they're doing in Morocco, and we are receiving uh, 27 countries uh, this week in, in Rwanda uh, for the same exchange and see how we can continue to work together around vaccine availability, vaccine use, vaccine research and production. So mRNA is a new technology and seeing how it has helped to get vaccine in nine months is a hope that we can all uh, do things even starting from a certain level of baseline. So Rwanda believes that uh, using or taking this uh, momentum of having uh, new technologies like mRNA uh, to speed up uh, the efforts and cut unnecessary steps uh, that we were spending more uh, in planning in processing and discussing and go straight into availing the tools that we need, uh, such as mRNA vaccines for uh, malaria, for HIV and COVID and other diseases that are still prevalent on our continent it is actually a priority in our leadership this morning alluded to that. And that's how we see ourselves in um, pressure to make it happen. And uh, I don't think uh, we should have prepared 40 years to be able to have the vaccines in nine months as mRNA technology has been waiting uh, this time, but COVID times pushes us uh, to run even faster. Uh, and the current um, agreement that the government uh, and uh, our institutions signed with BioNTech, uh, with uh, my colleagues in, in, uh, from Senegal, uh, our ministers of health signed uh, uh, this, uh, I think, a month, a month ago. And we, we hope, we aim actually to start this production uh, uh, in the next few months, uh, mid next year, uh, is uh, that, that confirmation that you don't need to wait long, long time to be able to achieve that. And it's not for us only, it's not for Rwanda, because as I said, these diseases do not uh, respect any border. So it's, it's for the entire African community. Uh, to maybe summarize my key points, because most of the things have been said, um, we should, shouldn't be um, having kind of a competition in this race to get vaccine produced. More complementality is required. And, and this is a chain, it's, it's an ecosystem where there's a lot of pieces that we can all play and, and contribute because at the end, there's a, a billions of people waiting. And I don't think we have even 1% or 2% production here of vaccine that we need and it would probably take years. So the action is, is clear and we are very happy to be part of this process. And I'm sure we will make it if we continue on this momentum. Thank you. You know, all I can say is welcome to the vaccine manufacturing uh, endeavors in Africa. Dr. Amadou So, welcome joining us. Scaling up more traditional technologies are also important. So we're talking about mRNA, but your more traditional technologies. How, what would it take to do that? What kind of materials do you need? What, what, how can... We all collectively work together on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, um, 
Mr. Chair, uh, uh, for, for this invitation um, from Africa CDC and also from all the different organizers. And thank you also for the Rwandese government for hosting us for these important meetings. Um, I will switch uh, to, to French uh, so I can be more comfortable about explaining my point. Ce que je voulais dire très précisément, c'est que effectivement, quand il a fallu augmenter les capacités pour faire de la production de vaccins contre la COVID, bien évidemment, l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar, Dakar, CDC, avec Africa CDC, with the African Union, to capitalize all the experiences that have as a vaccine manufacturer, and also by basing on 80 years of uh, uh, vaccine production. This type of experience is very important. It's a long experience that will enable us in one hand to know well the, the, the needed ecosystem so that we can have a regulatory-based environment and all the logics uh, well in place so that we can carry out this activity. The element that is very significant is to work with the different centers. As we heard, Rwanda, Morocco, we are working end in end in terms of producing vaccine in Africa. And within this context, we, we have this technology that is still ongoing and uh, we need to learn a lesson uh, to see how to fund this technology because we are in the first stage of uh, building capacity for this technology and uh, all the experiences we learn from this technology which is hot we try to capitalize in building up madiba project which is to produce locally for that that is the two elements, which is the very important lesson we need to keep in mind uh, for this method. First of all, it's a robust process that will enable us to speed to move uh, speedily uh, in terms of uh, processing the scaling up. It's very important for this kind of uh, activity or technology, and we need also to readjust our experience. The second lesson is the production of a vaccine is a, a question of uh, human resources. In terms of having a quality based human resources, the technology, the technology that we can have to boost capacity to produce in a better condition. When I'm talking about quality based uh, HR, because uh, manufacturing vaccine needs to comply with the rules to be more strict, you see, to, to, to see how we can sustain our know-how, but we need also to evolve in a very suitable uh, regulatory-based environment. Since we can have a, a very difficult uh, HR that we can have with uh, plus this technology, I think this is two components which is very important to capitalize. This is, these are the two elements the basic basics one, first of all, the environment needs to be suitable. Second, the quality-based personnel. And I think also it's important for us to know that within the framework of this exercise, the coordination to be with the other is for me a key one is paramount and um, we need to avoid overproduction also but uh, having experience work with the other producers for example i salute the fact that we have african association of vaccine manufacturers that we uh, called uh, amia as a work that will be uh, in collaboration for what is in place. I'll try to conclude by trying to uh, remind two messages. The first one, to carry out production, we need a very strong support coming from the different governments. 
that will be very good for us to move forward in our experience. Also for uh, the fast tracking process, the government has uh, availed some resources on the side, whether financially oriented resources, but we need also the partners. For that, we having this environment, I think that will be very important. Do not forget in our uh, reflection, we need important leadership. We need also unity so that we can move uh, within the same direction in this discussions within the African context. I know Africa has a capacity, but we need also to work well as a system members. So that is the one of the message I can just provide regarding this um, uh, increase or scaling up based on the existing technology. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you for, for your message. Uh, Dr. Shahir Badisi, not last but not the least. Um, what scaling up of traditional technologies? What are you, how, what's your message for us? How should we do it? Thank you. Perfect. So, um, first of all, first of all, Mina Farm is a. Is a uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Perfect. So thank you. So first of all, Minofarm is a biotech company which is uh, based in Egypt, and uh, we've been manufacturing end-to-end -end recombinant therapeutic proteins uh, for the past 21 years. And um, uh, on top of that, we also have many monoclonal antibody biosimilars in the pipeline that we develop on African soil. So in our R&D teams in Cairo, in Egypt. Uh, before doing clinical trials in Europe and then la launching to the African uh, uh, market. So on top of that, we've also uh, completed a successful tra tech transfer for the Sputnik V uh, vaccine, uh, where we will be manufacturing in our new facility in Cairo, um, 40 million doses per year. Uh, end to end um, from cell line to purification based on our experience in this. Uh, we're also working on uh, various uh, gene therapy projects. So, um, and we do this together with our uh, subsidiary based in Berlin. Um, the reason we kind of this 21 experience in the end to end manufacturing on African soil, we have a lot of experience and challenges that we would like to, to share. and. I think we need to build the really sustainable infrastructure that ju doesn't just focus on um, outbreak vaccines, but also on immunization vaccines or legacy expanding novel, and then use this capacity during an outbreak. And this is what we're doing also at Minoform, focusing on recombinant proteins, adenoviral production, VLPs, and potentially RNA. And from our experience also, what's very important is that this local manufacturing does not only help equitable supply during an outbreak, but we have been able for the past 20 years to really provide um, advanced therapies at really affordable prices. And this is what we really need in our continent. So there are three very brief um, 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 avenues that we should focus on. And uh, from our experience, we really want all partners to also focus on. The first one is manufacturing landscape. Um, we have a very wide landscape of different manufacturers on the continent. We have some who have access to technologies and have the facility, like in our case, we have others who have one of both. Uh, we have some that are experts at film and finish. So it's very important that we all come together and discuss in some sort of consortium, uh, understand how we can fulfill this chain from beginning to end, set up hubs, regional hubs, work together, exchange technologies, exchange training, co-develop vaccines, and uh, provide API to each other. And Minafarm is really ready to, to do this with all partners. And we have also recently established our third biotech subsidiary, which focuses only on that, on bringing vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, and gene therapies that are manufactured end to end in Cairo to the African continent. Um, close to the end, so building infrastructure from our experience is important, but it's also very important to know that infrastructure in biotech, unlike small molecules, is facilities only. It is 
a culture, a culture of research, a culture of process development, optimization, tech transfers, and cultures, as we know, are only built by combining the individual parts. So we really have to co collaborate together to achieve this. The second avenue is access to patients. Um, we need as local manufacturers to have guarantees that we can supply the African uh, countries versus international uh, players, access to Gavi, UNICEF, WHO tenders, and prioritize really local manufacturing over international ones. And this is increasingly happening now in more and more countries in Africa. Uh, of course, also uh, strengthening the um, uh, national immunization programs and distribution. Uh, the final point, which uh, is the uh, avenue of regulatory process improvement, uh, of course, we're all very looking forward to uh, the African Medicines Agency, and um, this would uh, really help a lot of the things we're doing and the challenges we're facing now also, and have been facing for the past two decades. Um, and it's very important to consider uh, at least a continental process for joint review of market authorization applications. And this is something that we at Minafarm have found very challenging to really register their projects in so many different countries with different guidelines. And uh, of course, facilitate multi-center clinical trials and bridging of studies. And the last point is simply that from our expertise, um, 20 years ago when we wanted to register our first self-developed biologic, which was for hepatitis C, in Egypt, um, the, the guidelines for the biologic or biosimilars were not there. So the authorities thankfully used the EU guidelines to as a template that they then uh, used in Egypt as well. And this really helped us, but it was important to realize that it's not just about guidelines and being told how to do it, but it's very important to set up the regulatory infrastructure. And this takes time. And uh, maybe that's why we should also adopt a phasic approach where we facilitate it in the short term for uh, manufacturers who are ready to reach the African continent. So looking at biosimilars, for example, um, more and more countries, including the United Kingdom, the MHRA, they now uh, allow you to waive phase three um, in, in, in return of doing a much larger phase one, which is something maybe that we can also consider in the African continent when we're looking at maybe vaccine biosimilars as well. So uh, in summary, I think all manufacturers really have to come together, see how we can complement each other, the regulatory process improvements, which is already taking place, and of course, the access to patients and the guarantees for local manufacturers. And hopefully we can also apply these efforts also for the therapeutic uh, aspects. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Um, so to me, the, the takeaway message from our participants is no, no doubt we can do it. Research and development is important and especially if if we we want to look at vaccines that affect africa we need to build capacity and i think one of the major things is we need to start see how we can collaborate how we can work together to build that capacity uh, and how we can start sharing it um support from governments are very important and then also your and with that, then the regulatory support that's needed, but not only that to sort out the regulatory environment, but also the offtakes. Who's going to buy your products and, and then see how we can utilize then the technologies that and the experience then to start looking at things such as gene therapies, um, your monoclonal antibodies, and, and, and so on. And, and not to only be dependent on what the Gavis and the UNICEFs gives us, but wider than that as well. So thank you for your contribution of all the panelists members. Uh, Dr. Ibere, back to you, and thank you for the opportunity for that we could have our discussion on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Glodina for um, that round table discussion that was around the country perspective. We'll have a, a session uh, after lunch. Lunch is the next uh, uh, step that we have. So 
Uh, we'll have a lunch break between now and 2.25 before we resume for the afternoon. So we'll have more engaging sessions coming, um, notably a roundtable discussion on international, you know, from an international perspective. And we'll have many manufacturers uh, joining us for, for that panel. Uh, we'll also uh, be able to accommodate uh, additional speakers in the afternoon. So for now, just to thank you for uh, being with us, to the panelists that joined us online, to the panelists that are here in the room, and invite our guests to a lunch break between now until 2.25, where we'll be back in the room to hear um, the next roundtable discussion. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I forgot to mention the location for lunch. We have ushers outside the room that will take us to the lunch uh, uh, location, which is downstairs in the ballroom. So downstairs in the ballroom. Thank you.